together today. I'm Robert, and uh, we're going to start with. Uh, hey, what a crowd! What a crowd! <laughs> uh, we're going to open up with. You're feel free to stand and sing, or sit and sing if you want. Looking at the lyrics here, the uh, the first paragraph says chorus, and then the other, all the rest of them are verses. It says verse, chorus, chorus, but it's one chorus and all the rest are verses. I am the thinker. Here we go. I am the thinker who thinks the thought that changes things that shape my life. I am the thinker who thinks the thought I have the power to change my life. And if you ask me, who am I? I am wisdom, I am light. I am more than meets the eye. I cannot be defined. Back to the chorus. I am the thinker who thinks the thought that changes things that shape my life. I am the thinker who thinks the thought I have the power to change my life. Verse 2. And if you ask me what am I? I am beauty, I am joy, I am more than meets the eye. I cannot be defined. I am the thinker who thinks the thought that changes things that shape my life. I am the thinker who thinks the thought. I have the power to change my life. I can choose to be the light and brighten someone's darkest night. And more that meets the eye, I cannot be defined. I am the thinker who thinks the thought that changes things that shape my life. I am the thinker who thinks the thought I have the power to change my life. I have the power to change my life. I have the power to change my life. I just want to say a special thanks to Rob for being here. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, everyone, on this pre-Halloween. Can you believe it's almost November and holiday time, and it sure flies, I tell you. Well, uh, my name is David Burke, and I'm your trustee on duty today on behalf of Reverend Donna and the Board of Trustees. It is my privilege and honor to welcome you here to the Sonoran Center, uh, Desert Center for Spiritual Living. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> they changed the words. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Whoever you are and wherever you are on your spiritual journey, you are truly welcome here. Here you will be validated, supported, and encouraged to be all that you are meant to be. Our vision statement is love in action every day in every way. We express this love by learning and living the principles of the science of mind. You will find our declaration of principles in the back of your program. Please join me now in reading them. Uh, I believe there is an intelligent intelligence operating throughout the universe. I believe this intelligent power is only good. I believe this intelligence expresses as me. I believe through my conscious use of this power, I create my life as happy, healthy, and complete. And so it is. Do we have any first timers today? We have George and Fran back returning. 
Yay! Second time. All right. Well, welcome back. We're glad you're here. Anyone else? We hope that you'll all stay and get to know us a little better after and have some refreshments. There's uh, plenty of food, according to Susan, so please stop and have something. Have a bunch. Have a bunch. <laughs> all right. Um, I would like to thank you all for being here because you're the ones that make this place so special, and it really is. And so thank you very much. I also want to thank everyone who helped make this Sunday celebration happen. Uh, the girls back there with the food, and um, Don, and Lynn, and Wanda, and Bruce for property maintenance and setting up the chairs. And, and we may actually need a few more in here soon. So that is awesome, too. Um, and everyone else who does so much and helps in many, many ways. So thank you. Um, please direct your attention now to the announcements uh, that are in your bulletin. And if you're watching online, please visit cslaz.org for the, our announcements and our events calendar. OK. The God in me beholds the God in you. It is all for the greatest and highest good. The God in me beholds the God in you. And you and I are one. Namaste. The God in me beholds the God in you. It is all for the greatest and highest good. The God in me beholds the God in you. And you and I are one. Namaste. Namaste. Good morning. Good morning. I'm John Lopez and I am your practitioner for today. And the practitioners are the healing arm of our center. We are here to do spiritual mind treatment. I love that phrase for you. During the week, if you have anything going on that you would like prayer for, you can fill out a card over at the table or you can uh, come up to me. Um, you know, I forgot my shawl. You can come up to me after service uh, if you would like treatment and uh, we will pray for you and do treatment for you during the week. So join me in our opening invocation. 
take a breath. Know with me that God is all there is. Everywhere equally present, filling all space, filling this sanctuary, expressing in through and as each one of us here this morning. I express my gratitude knowing that today's service is already a perfect idea in the mind of spirit through the wonderful spiritual music this morning, through our wonderful writers who are here to give us a special treat and share their talent and share their vision. I'm so grateful for those who are behind the scenes to make this service possible. And I'm so grateful to be here for this teaching right here and right now. And so we say together, and so it is. Okay. So since we do have a special treat this morning with sharing from our writers group, I am not going to do a reading. We're going to go right into the main event. And so, um, Let's see. Do you have any special music to play before we go into the? Yeah, OK. And then I'll introduce our main event. <laughs> First of all, I want to say thank you so much for sharing the platform with us, Reverend Donna, and for the practitioners. I really, this just thrills me to no end. We're in place. Cornucopia, an abundant supply of good things. A cornucopia of pleasures. And today, the writing group will bring you a cornucopia of stories. It is the end of October. It is the gateway to upcoming holiday season when traditions and good things abound. And in case you've forgotten, I have made a couple of lists. <laughs> Top five list of good things you probably did in the past and maybe still do. Attend a homecoming dance. Trick or treat it. Although today we trick or drink 
<coughs> Carved pumpkins, explored corn mazes, and visited cemeteries for a sense of the macabre. <coughs> Top five list of things that you may have done in the past but may not want to do in Green Valley. Jump in a pile of leaves. <laughs> Start a bonfire. <laughs> Bob for apples, and that's for a myriad of reasons, including dentures, holding our breaths, and trying to, <laughs> trying to straighten up after we've bent over for a while. Exploring corn mazes. We can't even get through Suicide Safeway. <laughs> and the main thing that we may not want to do today is visit cemeteries. We may, may not be able to escape. <clears throat> so today, the writing group has brought stories of the carnicopia type. They have brought you Halloween stories. Thank you. <coughs> We'll try to see if this works. They have brought, they have brought you Halloween stories, reflections, memories, challenges that they've gone through in the past, and hopes. The one thing they all have in common, all these stories, is the di divine gift of creativity. And lest you have the wrong impression of me, I want to clear up a couple of things. You may have heard some uh, grumbling in the past few weeks about my insisting on certain assignments like um, writing all dialogue for a story without using he said, she said, they said, etc. <laughs> Gotta have the glasses on, right? I can't see a thing without them. <laughs> Or the other assignment about um, writing descriptive stories with no adjectives or adverbs. <laughs> or the one about do not write using are, was, is, were, etc., but using verbs that have action. So in spite of what you might have heard, I'm not a witch. <laughs> so, we, now, I can barely see you guys. I think I'll take this off. <laughs> I love the humor in the... I love being able to just be myself. What can I say? <laughs> so, without, by the way, th we're gonna have eight stories today, but there are others okay. in the writing group who chose not to read today, and I would like to acknowledge them as well. So if you are in the writing group, please stand. And we had a couple others join us this week, and they're not standing. So the, the writing group is, is uh, growing, and I so, am so grateful for it. So the first reader today is Jean. Wait, I was going to wear the hat. <laughs> you want the hat? It doesn't fit me. It's not you think I look good? <laughs> Never mind. That's kind of scary. Ah. Oh. I'm going to read you what I wrote for the writers group this week, and it's about Halloween, and it's called The Feast of the Dying Sun. Gather around, my friends, and sit near. I have some facts that I want you to hear about the largest holiday celebration in the world, Halloween. It's a holiday steeped in spiritual, paranormal, and historical traditions, a descendant of the Celtic Samhain feast. Cover your windows. Lock your doors. October 31st is near. People living in the coastal Atlantic areas of Europe 
celebrated the Feast of the Dying Sun at the end of summer, a kind of New Year's event. The Celtic people thought the sun symbolically died at the end of summer and would not be revived until Beltane in the spring. All household fires were extinguished and darkness covered the land. A large community bonfire was built and individuals carried embers home from the community fire to relight their family hearths. One enterprising uh, Irish guy named Jack was forever remembered because he carved out a gourd with a face on it to carry his ember home. During, it's true, <laughs> during this period of darkness, the spiritual and paranormal sides of Sawian came forth. The Celts believed that the veil separating the living from the dead, the past from the present, and the world of the Fae from the human world was at its thinnest at this time and be, could be crossed through via various portals. These beliefs may have provided the basis for the cool time traveler novels. Um, the Celts felt that Samhain was the perfect time to contact relatives and friends who had passed on. Day of the Dead celebrations may have originated from this concept but dead ancestors often tried to drag the living back through portals. So the living dressed in costumes to fool the spirits of their ancestors. Young women thought that by doing string and card tricks, they could visualize their future husbands. And they went door to door doing magic tricks for others who then provided them with treats. Apples were the most popular of those treats. But cookies called soul cakes were also given to poor people at this time who went door to door. Now, the Celtic people didn't view fairies as little Tinkerbell characters. Oh no, the Fae, as the Celts called them, were fearsome, sensual creatures. Humans could be easily lured through the portals by sexual promises. But the portals could bo work both ways. On the island of Skye, a fae princess came through a portal and offered Ian McClyde a marriage that would last for a year and a day. And the relationship produced this child. The fae princess wrapped the baby in her cloak, a white cloth with a, a blue X across it, and told Ian never to let the baby cry. He didn't. And the fae princess gave him a gift, the recipe for the famous whiskies produced in the Isle of Sky. <laughs> As Christianity became the dominant religion in the area, Christian traditions were incorporated into the customs and beliefs of the Celts. November 1st was designated as All Souls Day, and October 31st became All Hallows Eve, or Halloween, a holiday filled with spiritual and paranormal traditions. After arriving in the United States, Halloween was turned into a commercial holiday. And it is today. When you tip over that plastic jack-o'-lantern on the porch, and it's covered with that god-awful candy corn, stop to consider the spiritual, cultural, and paranormal themes that are associated with Halloween. is history and superstition too. Witches call it spells. Christians call it prayers. Spiritualists call it manifestations. Atheists call it a placebo effect. Scientists call it quantum physics. Everyone is arguing over its name. No one, however, is denying its existence by an anonymous writer. Make-believe is what my mom taught us. She was an artist at Disney, and she not only worked on Fantasia, but she actually lived it and believed in it. Her explanation of Halloween was an opportunity to create costumes for my sisters and me. One of my favorites was when we each had our own ballerina tutus. 
Our bodices were of different satin colors. Our skirts were white foil and had sequins and glitter scattered everywhere. Our faces were rouged, our eyes were colored in purple grease paint. Of course, we had tiaras and wands. We lived on Balboa Island near Newport Beach at this time. We were free spirits. It was 1954. In those days, we truly were free to roam the island on our own with our friends. No worries about dangerous people, no concerns about bad candy, no fear of abduction of one of us. We were carefree. We were children. We were happy. We lived in a fantasy world with spells of protection swirling around us. Call it whatever name suits your beliefs, prayers, manifestations, placebo effects. I know it by the definition of make-believe. Trick or treat, my trick is to retreat back to the magic of make-believe. So I have a ghost story. <laughs> My writing students at Pima are all about ghost stories this time of year. To be honest, it's not my favorite genre, although it was assigned <laughs> by our leader here. <laughs> I, have, I have never seen a ghost, nor do I care to. Ghost tours seem to be all the rage, but I'll pass and go for louder events with real living people. Yet, I have had at least two ghostly encounters that may seem a bit spooky, yet also are somehow reassuring. Of, co of course, the ghosts involved were two of my favorite people, my mom and my dad. My mom died suddenly at 93. I flew out to Naperville, Illinois, Illinois the next day and met up with my older brother and sister in her driveway. They had an interesting tale to tell. They had just come from the mortuary, where a swarm of bees made it difficult to enter. They had just managed to get inside where the two owners, twin brothers, who had once been my mother's yard boys, had this story to tell. One day, when they were working at my mom's house, they came running to her back door to ask for a can of Raid. They told her they couldn't finish mowing because there was a swarm of bees. My mother refused to give them the raid and patiently explained to them that bees were an endangered species that many flowers and crops depended upon, so they should just leave that part of the yard alone. Apparently, they were still following her advice at their new place of business. We laughed at the story and then went to the side door that still held the Vietnam-era light-up peace sign. It opened into the breezeway the site of the dining room table where we had shared many meals and celebrations lovingly prepared by my mom. A little bee was there first, buzzing around happily. We looked at each other and were thinking the same thing. It was mom there to greet us. The bee reminded us of our mother's laughter and joy when she hadn't seen us for a while. Then we let it outside and it flew away. I stayed in the house that night and sat down on her couch to write a eulogy. Somehow the words just flowed. Something our writing group can attest doesn't always happen. When I spoke at her memorial the next day, it was about the flowers and birds and sunsets that she had pointed out to us over the years and how the sight of those things would forever remind us of her. I left the bee out of the talk, but it was really the inspiration. At this point, my dad had been dead for 30 years, but he paid a surprise visit as well, perhaps checking up on things. A few days later, early in the morning, my sister and I were awkwardly loading my dad's full-size marimba into her car to go back to her home on the East Coast. While we stood there, a bit winded from our exertions, a coyote walked down the middle of Main Street. It stood looking at us for a few minutes, as coyotes do, before heading on down the street towards the Burlington train like many commuters would be doing in another hour or so. While we were still standing there, shocked, a man walked by with a little white dog on a leash. Did you see the coyote, we asked. 
He didn't seem the least bit surprised. He said, oh yes, they followed the train tracks throughout the suburbs. The man and his dog calmly walked on while my sister and I thought of our dad. He was an engineer for his day job, but also told stories to entertain us on the long car trips from Illinois out west for our summer vacations. His main character was Shadow, an inventive coyote who rather like MacGyver in the old TV series, solved a variety of problems using old-fashioned ingenuity. My favorite story was when Shadow invented peanut butter by laying peanuts on the road to be run over. <laughs> My sister remembered him inventing nuclear energy, which was then and still is over my head. Both my sister and I felt sure it was dad supervising the care with which we loaded his favorite instrument. I personally wasn't sad my sister was inheriting the marimba because I remember my dad playing at 6 a.m. on Saturday mornings under our bedroom window. His favorite song was a very lively flight of the bumblebees. <laughs> Remembering these encounters got me thinking about what animal I would choose to come back as. I asked my 88-year-old friend, Dick, on our way back from El Dorado days in Tombstone this weekend, what he would come back as if given a chance to visit his loved ones. Without missing a beat, he said he would be a hawk. I know he enjoys looking at things, so now that he doesn't drive anymore, I realized how special it was for him to go on day trips. I asked another friend, Leslie, who happens to love Halloween, what she would be, and she said skunk, because she could chase dogs and scare everyone. <laughs> As for me, I would have to be a raven. Ever since a lone male croaked at me one morning as I was feeding my ponies, as though to say, what about me, I have been feeding him, his partner, and sometimes his young ones. I asked him to come to speak to you personally, but since this is out of his normal range, I have borrowed Spooky <laughs> from the Two Back Library as a Raven stand-in. <laughs> Hi, Raven. I have always appreciated your devotion to your mate and your offspring. I know some Native American tribes even revere you as sacred. But what do you think of your superpower? I create my life with my thoughts. <laughs> Gotta get it just right. <laughs> Jack, get up here. The show's about to start. The attic window's a perfect spying spot. We can watch everyone at the neighborhood party. Oh, here I am, sis. I've sorted my Halloween candy. So here you go. I don't like candy corn. You can have all of mine. So quit bugging me. Truth is, we got so much candy, and I love it. And it was so much fun. And we got to go alone with our friends this year. And I fooled everyone with my witch outfit. No one guessed I was a boy. Yeah, I can relate. Nobody knew I was a butterfly. So check this out. Santa's barefoot, tossing rose petals in the swimming pool. Even better, Susie. Look, I think the Grinch is Travis McDougal and he's headed to Santa with a cocktail, who I am pretty sure is Harry Matthews. Travis drove his riding lawnmower over Harry's ro prize rose garden last summer. Travis claimed heat stroke, but I heard he was drunk. <laughs> I don't think either of them knows who the other one is right now. <laughs> I just saw a hobo get out of a red Ferrari convertible. That's nothing, Susie. Look at Cinderella flirting with the hunchback. I'm pretty sure that's her pool boy. <laughs> well, Jack, I see a good witch dressed in pink and doused in glitter, struggling to hold on to Gumby's hand in an attempt to drag him onto the dance floor. 
I think Gumby is confusing himself with one of those inflatable air dancers. Well, maybe he just doesn't like to dance. Oh, Jack, the way he's flailing around he is dancing. By the way, I'm experiencing time travel. Cleopatra has been kissing Dracula. It's an oxymoron for sure. Oh, that's nothing. The pirate keeps slow dancing with Barbie. He better watch out for Ken. <laughs> no worries, bro. He thinks that's Sophie Tompkins. And I heard mom and pop say that the pirate is Fred's dad and he's had a crush on Mrs. Thompson since high school. Truth is, that's actually Matilda Pringle. I saw her putting on her mask. <laughs> oh, well, hey look, the tin man's waiting in the kiddie pool. I think he's carrying a can of olive oil. Maybe he's searching for the salad bar. Uh-oh, bro. Do you see Mr. Potato Head? Quit digging your elbow in my side. Oh, wow. He's tottering with arms raised, and he's aiming for the twirling pumpkin. It looks like he's going to go in for a hug. Ugh. That didn't go well. It didn't end well, and it sure was fun seeing Darth Vader, Spider-Man, Flo from Progressive, and Patrick Mahomes uniting to pick them both up. I loved it when Mr. Potato, no, oops, wrong one. I loved it when Mr. Potato Head yelled, I'm, tr I'm, tr I'm truly sorry, I thought you were my girlfriend. She said she was dressing as an orange vegetable. <laughs> hmm, hmm, Susie, why do you think everybody loves Halloween? Do you think it's because we can hide who we really are? Well, Jack, I'm thinking you're probably right. For this one event, we are all anonymous, come to think about it. Yep, at Halloween, all our masks come off as we keep them on. Namaste. The great Halloween pumpkin roost. <laughs> a smiling, energetic, enthusiastic Michelle came bounding down the hallway from her room to the sliding glass door, which she swung open and went out into the garden, which was flourishing with all kinds of overgrowth, including an area with, uh, where the vegetation had been planted. She had planted, with my help, a pumpkin seed there shortly before this. And every morning in this late October, she'd come running down the hall, eagerly opening the door, going out to look to see if her pumpkin had grown. Well, once again, she came in to the house, shaking her head. <clears throat> well, I'd taken part in that fantasy as a part of uh, wanting her dream to come true and planting the pumpkin seed. I had not explained to her at the time that it took time for the pumpkin to grow. She was four years old. But I couldn't bear the, her disappointment, the look of disappointment on her face any longer. So after she went down for her nap, I got in the car, went up to the Safeway store, and there was a big display of pumpkins outside, which is where she got the inspiration to have a pumpkin of her own. I bought one about the size of a volleyball, put it in the trunk of the car, drove home, and waited for her to go down for her uh, sleep at night. Took the pumpkin out, took it out to the pumpkin patch, and put it about where she had planted the seed. <clears throat> the next morning, Halloween morning, she came bounding down the hall again, opened the sliding door, went outside, and Patricia, my wife, who I believe was the, uh, actually the author of this ruse, uh, and I waited 
And she came in with the biggest smile on her face, and I can't believe it. And she was excited about her pumpkin. It was a slight deceit, but one that paid an unforgettable memory. That's been over 50 years ago now, but I still remember it with the uh, joy in my heart that uh, I felt at that time. Michelle is an example of the enthusiasm uh, of a, a child with a dream that comes to pass. And she carries it over to this day. And uh, every Halloween I get a chance to revisit that memory and to think about how much I love her and how by planting a seed, something prospers and grows. And we practice that here as evidenced by the symbol on front of the bed. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. The story I'm going to share with you is absolutely true. It took place in the state of Washington, in the city of Bellingham, Washington, and it pertains to my youngest brother's neighbor, Bill, and it's called Bill's Shoes. I knew a man named Bill who was a fisherman, which is a tough way to make a living. He drank, he smoked, and he swore a lot, and it was killing him and he knew it. He had to change his lifestyle, so he decided to stop. Now, to quit drinking is difficult for anyone, but to quit drinking, stop smoking, and stop swearing all at the same time, almost unheard of. So Bill went down and bought himself a new pair of shoes. New pair of shoes, you say? How do new shoes help? He bought a new pair of shoes to remind him that every time he puts them on, he's walking a new path a path of no more drinking, smoking, or swearing. Now Bill's passed away, and he's on another new path again. This time it's the path to heaven. But he left behind his shoes of 37 years. Over 37 years of walking the path that he promised himself and all of those who knew and loved Bill. And he left his old shoes behind to remind us if there's anything in your life that you need to change, go buy a new pair of shoes and start walking your new path. In loving memory of William Bill Total, born 1933, deceased 2022. May you rest in peace, Bill. Thank you. I think my spaceship knows what I must do. This title is blatantly taken from David Bowie's Space Odyssey. Some people take to the cadence of a meditation guide's voice, like cheesecake takes to hips. Not me. My hips are cheesecake ready, but my mind vaults around like a deranged squirrel in a half full burlap sack of unshelled peanuts guide. Imagine yourself opening the gate to a lush green meadow. Butterflies chase one another on sunlit currents of freewheeling breezes. Insects trill as you lie in the soft grass. The sun warms your skin. Your mind meanders along the sunbeams. What? Meadows aren't soft. Meadows are oceans of scratchy field grasses. Meadows harbor bugs. Meadows hide anchor catching gopher holes. This guide has never been in a real meadow. Guide. Imagine yourself walking up a mountain path. Up ahead you see a cave. You see people praying in its opening. 
the path becomes steeper. You must push open an aged, rusting gate if you want to go farther. Trusting, you push the decrepit barrier aside and realize you're walking into a mystical experience. Mystical experience, my ass! I am oxygen deprived. I don't like heights. I hug the inside of the path and I don't look down. Guide. Imagine yourself creating a gate between the worlds. It is yours to open or shut at will. Why create a them and me barrier? What if we can freely flow from one world to another? What if there's no gate? My mom stuffed a towel, a sandwich, and a banana into my beach bag and said, run down to the pool. I'll see you later in the afternoon. The run down to the pool part meant running a mile through an electric company's right of way at the southern end of the lake. The right of way was a steep, hilly, football field wide clearing where the New Jersey Power and Light Company exercised their right of way privileges and planted huge metal lattice towers to carry electricity to the Lake Mohawk residents. It also happened to be a shortcut to the pool, a swimming and tennis court complex modeled after the main deck of the SS Normandy. Originally thickly wooded, this swath was guardianed by the Mohawk and Lenape tribes of indigenous people. In 1788, the first settlers, a miner, arrived. Dutch and German herdsmen who followed him finagled ownership of the land for pennies and trinkets. Using rocks and stones, they immediately walled off their sections of land, felled trees which encouraged native grasses to flourish, built styes, styles, and gates to ease the passage between the fields, and grazed dairy cattle in the man-made meadows. 136 years later, a real estate company and private investor purchased, perhaps with nickels and bigger trinkets, 6,400 acres of farmland from its Dutch owners. They cleared the northern end of what were called the Brogdon Meadows, and in 1926 dammed several natural springs, which then took two years to fill into a private lake. In 1928, the new residential community of Lake Mohawk, New Jersey was officially open for business. Cramming my red sneakers into the beach bag, I would stand barefoot at the top of the weedy, rock-strewn right-of-way and survey the landscape. It was time to play the game. The game was always and never the same. Nature is seldom content with the status quo. I learned to look for critters, wind-blown branches, a stone that shifted seemingly overnight. I learned to listen for bird song or its lack and the whisper of errant breezes. My mind formed a perfect catalog of the way before me. It did not need my physical eyes for guidance. Standing on a flattish stone, I raised my arms in a powerhouse V like the Marvel, co Marvel comic book characters. Closed my eyes and leaped. With my eyes tightly shut, I could run for the joy of it, for the feel of grass, weeds, rocks, and earth against my bare calloused feet. I knew exactly where I was on the trail by the scent of the berries in season, the trill of a sun-drenched bird, or the height of various grasses that touched my effortlessly running legs. Mind knows no gates or styles. It sees this world and the ones beyond as one. Guide. You've tied a striped beach towel around your shoulders like a magic cloak. Your bare feet vibrate with the energies of the earth. They know exactly where to step. Imagine yourself running with eyes wide shut you are a vibrant ray of source energy. If I'm a vibrant ray of source energy, why am I frightened about driving in traffic or forgetting my Microsoft password? Why do I forget that mine knows the way 
and there are no gates. Guide. <sighs> because you're human, and humans self-create fears. Well, this human vibrant ray, AKA deranged squirrel, still balks at following the cadence of a meditation guide's voice. That's okay. I am a ray of source energy. I am my own best guide. That being said, why do my hips still avidly cling to cheesecake? <laughs> Thank you. I'm not going to say Johnny Cash. <laughs> uh, my uh, writing is a little different, uh, but it's relevant. It's called Hope. A great man once said, the only thing you have to fear is fear itself. Perhaps the follow-up to this remark would be, don't lose hope in whatever has happened or happening. As I awoke this morning, the birds were singing, the sky was sunny and clear. I was truly at peace. I heard a voice coming from another room, and when I reached the voice, it was coming from my TV. Breaking news, women, children, and babies were slaughtered today in the Middle East. In my mind, I wondered, what has happened to my peace? I had hoped for a peaceful day. The sun was still bright, the birds were still singing. Where was this awful news happening? Not in my community, not in my world. Finding the source of the voice, I was able to turn it off. Now I could continue to my peaceful morning, or could I? This is my life, it's also God's life, and God created all life. Maybe if I shut my eyes, all of the bad will disappear, like some kind of illusion, something happening in another world, not my world. I've always had hope. The dictionary defines hope as a feeling of expectations with a desire for certain things to happen. Hope often includes trust, but trust in what? Maybe I'm talking about trust in God to make all the bad things go away. However, if I am a part of God, then trust is first my responsibility. I am not only a part of the one God, God's life is my life to live. Let me begin by trusting myself to affirm there is a perfect outcome to a world that appears to be out of control. However, Affirmation requires action. How much time each day am I spending loving my friends and my enemies? How much time am I praying for the perfect outcome to the wars that continue to be frequent and inhumane? How much time am I spending with God each day feeding the lifeline that connected me to God? When I see or learn of someone I do not understand, am I spending some time for understanding? When I turn on the TV, what am I watching? Do I avoid the unpleasant and maybe ask myself, is this avoidance make me a better person? Or is it as a means of telling myself, this is not the world I choose to live in or be a part of? If the latter be true, how would I describe the world I would choose to live in? What do I hope for? There are many questions, and to date I have not many answers. However, I know the answers exist. I'm only one person in a world of an estimated 8 billion people. What can I do that will affect those 8 billion souls? After all, I'm an old person with not much time left on this planet. Time, time, time. How much time does it take to pray each day? How much time does it take for understanding? for setting an intention of hope, to affirm I'm a part of this God with the power given to me to create a perfect world. I can imagine such a world. I can hope for such a world. Will I make the effort? 
I have the time. I've always had the time. Well, I make the time. Thank you. so much. I'm, I'm, my heart is filled. Um, I want to thank each and every one of my writer, my writer, they're my writers. <laughs> okay. The writers, uh, the wonderful writers, uh, and we still have, we always have room for more writers. Uh, we will probably be moving into the sanctuary very soon uh, for our writing group. We have outgrown the meditation room. Uh, which is just thrilling. Um, if you would like to join, please do. Uh, we meet every, or the second and fourth Fridays of um, each month from 10 until noon. My cards in the form of a bookmark or on the table if you need to get in touch with me. No experience necessary. All levels of writing are welcome. And uh, it's, it's about fun, thinking outside the box, and creativity. Thank you. All right, let's all uh, stand, if you like, and sing Turn, 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 made famous by the birds, written by Pete Seeger. And uh, for some reason, the piano isn't playing. What happened to the piano? There we go. To everything, turn, turn, turn. There is a season, turn, turn, turn And a time to every purpose under heaven A time to be born, a time to die A time to plant, a time to reap A time to kill, a time to heal a time to laugh, a time to weep To everything turn, turn, turn There is a season turn, turn, turn And a time to every purpose in heaven a time to build up, a time to break down, a time to dance, a time to mourn, a time to cast away stones, a time to gather stones together. To everything turn, 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 there is a season, turn, turn, turn And a time to every purpose under heaven A time to love, a time of hate A time of war, a time of peace A time you may embrace a time to refrain from embracing To everything turn, turn, turn There is a season turn, turn, turn And a time to every purpose under heaven a time to gain, a time to lose, a time to rend, a time to sow, a time for love, a time for hate, a time for peace. I swear it's not too late. To everything turn, 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 there is a seed. Turn, 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 and the time 
for every purpose under heaven. Thanks again, Kay. Thank you to all our amazing writers. It is <coughs> wonderful how much talent is in this congregation, how much history each one of us brings to our center. I am just blown away. I once knew someone who, who was living briefly here in Green Valley, who was kind of a snob. <laughs> and he thought, oh, well, Green Valley really is a place of uh, bourgeois type thinkers and people. And uh, he, he, he felt that uh, he was above that kind of uh, that kind of consciousness, and I said to him, "You know, you have no idea that each person here at this center brings a whole history of life with them, and that when when you get to know and speak to each one of you, that." There is such a richness of life history here. Anyway, that person no longer lives here in Green Valley. So <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so now it's time for our offering. So will you join me, please, in reading our offering affirmation, which is on the inside page of your program? My gift goes forth to heal, prosper, and bless all that it touches. It is evidence of my conviction that God is the source and substance of my supply. I share generously of my good knowing that it returns to me multiplied abundantly, and so it is. I am so blessed. I am so blessed. I am so grateful for all that I have. I am so blessed. I am so blessed, I am so grateful, I am so blessed, I am so blessed, I am so blessed, I am so grateful for all that I have, I am so blessed, I am so blessed. So grateful, I am so blessed. One more time, I am so blessed, I am so blessed, I am so grateful for all that I have. I am so blessed, I am so blessed, I am so grateful. I am so blessed. We are indeed so blessed. So I'd like to close out our service today with our closing treatment. So we'll, you'll take a breath and know with me that there is only God, that God is all there is. Filling this sanctuary to capacity and beyond. 
And I know, declare, and affirm that anywhere where there may be some kind of a challenge, despite the appearance, God is right there, fully, wholly, and completely, making all things right, making all things good. I know, declare, and affirm that there is any, if there is anyone here today facing any kind of a challenge, that God is right where you are, making everything whole, perfect, and complete in divine right timing and order. I'm so grateful for this truth. I'm so grateful for this center. I'm so grateful for this teaching. And join me together as we say, and so it is. So if we all stand and sing our closing song. Let there be peace, I am a stand for peace. Let there be love, I am a stand for love. Let there be joy, I am a stand for joy. We are making a new 